Hold on on tight tight for the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the the alternative alternative to the alternative alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, well, we're back again on the Investigative Journal on this Wednesday. Yes, it's Wednesday, December 13th, 2017 day in our calendar, Christmas just on the horizon. And I'm sure you're out there doing your Christmas shopping and everything, uh, getting ready to meet with your family, which is a good thing. And I'm not going to talk today about how Christmas is a pagan holiday and etc., etc., etc. We've done shows about that. Doesn't mean you still can't celebrate doesn't mean you can't celebrate, but it's good to know why we celebrate Christmas at this time of year. Is it really the birthday of Jesus? No, he wasn't born in the winter time. That can be proven through the biblical um, accounts, but we're not going to even get into that. We got a whole week or two to talk about Christmas, and I'm sure you're busy now shopping. This time of year, people are so caught up with the shopping of Christmas that you kind of forget about everything else in the world, and that's pretty good. When you think about what's going on, if you turn on the TV, if you turn on Hollywood, what are you going to get? You're going to get a dose of all these crazy movies that they make. And if you turn on the news, all you're going to hear about now is sexual harassment in the workplace and how men are falling like bowling pins in Hollywood, in Washington, all over the place in the private sector on harassment claims. Let me give you my take on that. But first I want to say what I'm going to dedicate most of the show. Yesterday I said I'm going to talk about where evil comes from. And where do we start when we look at it? Do we start back in the Clinton administration? Do we start back at the Eisenhower administration? (laughs) Do we start back at the Washington administration? Back when our country was formed, where do we go? Or we go back all the way millions of years, as those evolutionists would tell us. Go back all those years to a million years ago when evil was created, when we used to fight for our food. Or, if you don't believe in evolution, and you believe in creationism, should we start where the Bible starts? And you know, just for simplicity's sake, I know there's going to be people out there who believe in the biblical accounts, and I know there's others that say it's just a fantasy. But I'm going to start with the story of Adam and Eve, well, basically the Cain and Abel, and trace it from there. And give you a reason why I'm going to do that. But first, let me talk about sexual these sexual abuse cases in the country today. It seems like there's more and more that every day there's another claim coming out. And I have to tell you this: the Democratic Party is really behind it. Okay. And yesterday we talked about how you have to understand that there's more to the Democrat and Republican Party than what appears on the surface. So if you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, stay tuned. You may be following the wrong mule or the wrong elephant. Yes, you may be following the wrong one. And I suggest that you look at what I say, and that is there's a Hegelian dialectic going on here. And behind the scenes of that theory, you find a hidden group of people controlling everything and basically creating a stage play for you. It's not real. And I suggest that both parties work together, even though on the, on the, in the, uh, out in the open they seem to be fighting, for another agenda. And we talked about that yesterday. But what you're seeing today is sexual harassment taking on mainstream politics. That's all you hear about every day. You're waiting for another man to be accused of sexually harassing a woman in the workplace. Now, what do I think is behind it all? Here's what I think is happening. The Democratic Party is trying to politicize what people from the beginning of time have been doing. Men and women have been getting together for the beginning of time, no matter how you cut it, slice it, or whatever. It can't be stopped. That's how society continues. If men and women don't get together... There's no civilization. And how they do that, how they once, how they get together, differs in, from country to country, from even from state to state in our country, from society to society, from basically 
There are so many different ways that men and women get together that you're never going to stop it. But it appears the Democrats really want to do that. They want to stop how men and women associate. And what I mean by that is there's a difference between certain sexual workplace harassment claims that are leading to you know, people getting fired in the business world, from politicians resigning, from politicians being forced out of office, and basically men who prey on women, who basically rape them, assault them in a violent manner, force them to do things against their will, which differs from certain allegations that are coming out in the workplace today. Like, for example, I believe that there have been men that have been fired for basically insinuating they may like the woman. Or a woman may say, I felt pressured by this man the way he looked at me. I felt pressured by the way he touched me on the shoulder. Or I felt pressured because he gave me a kiss at an office party on the cheek. Or he moved against me in the workplace as I was walking down the hallway. Now that to me is a lot different than a woman being attacked by a man and raped, or attacked by several men and raped. There is game that goes on between men and women, folks, and that is the game of seduction, right? Every man and every woman has experienced it in their life. And the question I have is, do women want to be continually treated like women? Or do they want to be treated like men? And I doubt whether the civilization will continue if men and women can't feel, in a sense, the freedom to flirt. Now, is that a dirty word? Now, let me tell you something. You can have a marriage that's sound for 50 years and love one woman. But do you ever hear the old saying? <laughs> I really love you, but I, you know, you're walking down the street and you see this beautiful girl go and you can't help your eyes but turn. And your wife kind of hits you on the side and go, Charlie, let's go shopping. And you snap out of it, right? Never too old to look, right? But what is looking? What is this sense of you know, man and woman, does it, does it really mean because I treat a woman like a woman, let's say a woman, I'm an employer, and a woman walks in, and one of my employees walks into my office, and I say, wow, that's a pretty dress you have on, Alice. There was a day when that was a compliment. Now, a woman may go out and get an attorney and basically, you have a sexual harassment case. I, I know a guy came to me for some legal advice, which <laughs> I wonder why. Well, he knew I had a law degree, and I guess he didn't want to pay for an attorney. And he said that he had just been sued for sexual harassment. I said, what did you do? And he said, well, we walked through a crowded hallway, and the woman turned, and I turned, and I brushed against her, but... I brushed against her bottom. And I said, was that only, was that all you did? Did you, did you grab her? Did you kiss her? No, he says. I said, did you ever have any kind of eye contact? He said, well, of course, she was pretty. And I've said a few things and maybe, and she claims in the lawsuit that the work environment was not appropriate. I said, did she ever say anything to you that it was inappropriate? And he said, no. So, I mean, listen, there are many women who would take the compliment of, my Alice, you have a nice dress, and a simple brush in the office hallway, or a simple, maybe I walk by and I wink at her. Boy, you look pretty today. Now, there's some women, they may take that as a compliment. They may not feel pressured, but there's some that may. Now, what should the woman do that feels that that was going overboard. I think she should confront the boss and say, look at Harry, you know, did you do that because you really, you know, you have some sexual idea about me or just because I look pretty today? 
and confront them. And if you're just a woman that understands that men sometimes like to give compliments to women, then basically the problem solved. Sexual harassment in the workplace has gotten to the point where if I'm going to be an employer and I have a woman working with me, I'm going to have somebody else in my office, preferably a man and a woman, to listen to exactly what went on so that I don't get sued because guess what happens now? There was a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives that once said this, well, you may have 10 claims of sexual harassment against men, and maybe one or two are valid, but it's okay to convict all 12 or all 10. Now, what he's saying is it's okay to send innocent people and to charge innocent people without a fair hearing, right? Without a fair hearing. That's exactly what he's saying. Okay, so basically, basically what's happening is that if a woman claims sexual abuse, they're immediately now believed, and there's really no fair chance for men, especially in the private workplace. Corporations take quick action without any evidence whatsoever, and you're seeing that happen in uh, politics right now, in the public sector. I can go over a number of people, and uh, also in Hollywood. Now, there's a lot of difference between certain allegations that Harvey Weinstein, we know who Harvey Weinstein is, the producer in Hollywood, many of the allegations against Harvey, as they were against Bill Clinton, which seemed to be okay for the Democrats when Clinton was in office, even Hillary coming to the rescue of her husband and taking uh, Miss Broderick and, and raking her over the coals on things of rape. Charges of rape, charges of assault, I mean, a clear assault on a woman. It's like the difference between if a woman walks into my office and I'm a businessman and I grab her and push her against the wall and force her to kiss me, that's a bit different than me as the businessman making some sexual, well, not sexual advances, but maybe something that may seem oh so inappropriate today, but was acceptable 30 years ago by maybe saying, my, you look pretty today, Alice. And maybe even, you know, kissing her on the hand. That was a very common thing to do. And still in Europe today, if you look at societies in Europe, I lived in Italy a number of years and it was acceptable to meet someone that you really have no don't know and actually kiss them on the cheek. <laughs> so what have we done here in America now? The Democrats basically are mixing everything together and trying to politicize and legislate the way men and women get together. The way the the age-old art of seduction, the age-old art of a man, isn't it supposed to be the way it is? A man asks the woman out first. A man makes that first gesture. Now, who am I to say who's right or wrong? You in this country may be sitting here right now saying, yes, I've been, I've, I believe in, uh, you know, we used to have mores in this country where you couldn't even kiss a woman before you married her. You couldn't have sex with a woman before you married her. There was even a time when your parents chose who you married, and that still goes on in society today. In America, the way men and women treat each other differs so much that the Democrats now are trying to legislate something that's impossible to legislate, but used now as political expedients. Let me make an example. For 30 years, the Democrats supported Bill Clinton and if you look at Clinton's trail, he's not just the guy that sits in the office and say, oh my, you look pretty today, Alice. He's the guy that'll take a woman up against the wall. He's a guy that's been accused and charged with rape. And it seems the Democrats turned a blind eye. In fact, the other day there was a senator, Senator Hillebrand, 
who came out and said that President Trump ought to resign because there are a number of women who say that he sexually molested them. Now, what did Trump do at the worst? Well, he didn't rape them. He didn't force them into a closet. He basically did some of those things that you shouldn't do, but that sometimes are acceptable. And isn't it amazing that the women that basically are accusing him of maybe rubbing up against them, kissing him, kissing them when they didn't want to, didn't really care about it for 10 or 20 years. But guess what? As soon as he ran for president, it came out. And now the same thing. So Senator Gillibrand, or Hillibrand, the woman senator, said that he ought to resign for that. But where was she... During the years of Clinton, she was supporting Hillary Clinton. She was supporting Bill Clinton, turning a blind eye. Seems to me to be political expedience. Then <laughs> our tweeting president, who I kind of like at times, he turns uh, Washington into a, you know, if you're going to have an entertainment capital of the world outside of Hollywood, and Washington, D.C. is the entertainment capital of the world, you might as well make it interesting. He came out and said, Look at Senator Hildebrand, this hypocrite. She used to come to me in New York asking for camp campaign contributions, and she would do anything for them. <laughs> now, you have to remember, then Senator Hildebrand, along with Elizabeth Warren, another liberal senator, stated that that was being race, that was being sexist for saying she'd do anything for political money. But, you know, Trump said that about men. He said that about Senator Cruz. He said he'll do anything to get elected. He'll do anything for money. He'll do anything to get elected. So Trump is basically saying the same thing to a woman that he'd say to a man. And his press secretary, who happened to be a woman, came out and said, if you think that's sexist, your mind's in the gutter. <laughs> I kind of like the exchange. And to Senator Hildebrand, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And Trump was smart <laughs> enough to play that game to bring it out. And I find it to be hilarious. Now, we all know there's a difference between raping a woman and basically maybe at an office party, Kissing her on the cheek when she didn't want to. Maybe you had a little bit too much to drink. Now, do you realize that if you did that and you're a per person in of power, or even like my friend who ran a small business, you can be charged with sexual harassment. And he's sued for $5 million for that little episode I told you about. And he's now had to hire a lawyer. And it's costing him a lot of money. And guess what? In the court of public opinion, he's already considered guilty without ever having a trial, without ever being given the benefit of the doubt. And that's what the Democrats are trying to do now. They're doing it not only for political expediency, but for basically trying to politicize and legislate how the male and female species gets together and, and eventually keeps civilization going. Do you see any other way to keep civilization going if a man and a woman can't get together? And how are they going to get together now? I mean, think about it. Now... With this climate that the Democrats and people are buying into it, that's really ridiculous. Most people. What's happening here is men and women are going to keep an, you know, man's going to keep an arm's length now. Maybe that relationship that could have moved forward will never do. All I'm saying is you cannot legislate or politicize morals. Now, every, each and every one of us has the opportunity to delve into their own mind, delve into their own soul, and decide how you want to treat women. And you women, you want to decide how you want to treat a man. 
But in the end, there is no body, no political body, no political group in the world that can ever do it. And what's acceptable now, or not acceptable now, was maybe acceptable 30 years ago. Let me give you an example. Recently, there's an elect, uh, yesterday, or when was it? Uh, today. Yesterday, yes. Uh, a Democrat, for the first time in 25 years, became the senator of uh, Alabama over a guy named Judge Roy Moore, who basically had held office in Alabama for years, ran for Senate, and as he's running for Senate, there are three or four allegations that he went out with girls that were underage in Alabama, and this was 30 or 40 years ago. He denied the claims, but let's look at it. A couple of the mothers of those children, back then, they were 14 or 15, said, you're so lucky to be going out with a district attorney. And if you look back 30 or 40 years ago, it wasn't unusual that women in Alabama and the South were getting married at the age of 14, 15, and uh, even 13. Remember that great singer, that, that um, proud to be a, a coal miner's daughter who got married when she was 13? So the mores were a little bit different back then, but he was judged as a in the standard of today, 30 or 40 years ago, and my first question is, why didn't the woman, the women wait so long? Was it political expediency? Yeah, he lost the election over those claims because he didn't draw enough votes. But the point is, each case needs to be judged on its merits. Each man, each woman, no matter what. And, and we're not even dealing with the fact, can women ever cause sexual harassment in the workplace towards a man? Can they set a man up? <laughs> you know, you know, not every woman's the uh, uh, walking around as an angel in white clothing. And we have to look at both sexes and say each one deserves a fair hearing. And this whole idea, the, all these sexual claims coming out, you're going to hear of them all. You're going to hear more and more. Now they want Trump to resign. All it is is political nonsense, and we're getting caught up in it. And so, in the second half hour, I want to talk about where evil comes from. And this orchestration that's going on in Washington now with these claims, uh, you know, there's a, like I said, what's the bottom line? There's difference between Bill Clinton's charges and Harvey Weinstein's charges and others to simple uh, charges that are being looked at the same way. They're all being lumped together. And many people are losing their jobs when they shouldn't. And whether it be a man or a woman, you cannot deny that each one deserves a fair hearing, but unfortunately... If you're a man and you're charged with sexual harassment today, whether it be a peck on the cheek or you grab a woman's arm or, or you might brush against her butt, maybe you're even having fun and you tap her on the butt, you're going to be guilty without ever having a chance to prove your innocence. And that's what apparently the powers that be want now. And whether it's for political expediency or a way to basically make women to, you know, allow having men to treat women like men. And do women really want that? I don't think so. Back in three minutes on the investigative journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. 
If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border .org, C -R -O -S -S, cross the border .org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org. The following the program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the Supreme, by the Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command. But stand all people, people. Listen, listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal, and this half hour, I have a whole completely different subject to talk about. We started it yesterday, and that is, where does evil come from? And I'm telling you, you could come up with a hundred different examples of it, a hundred different uh, reasons why you think you know where evil comes from. You know, oh, it's hereditary. He was born evil. Oh, he became evil when he got involved with the bad people. He became evil when he joined the mafia. He became evil when he did this. He was evil from the beginning of time. Well, where does it really come from? I mean, how is evil transmitted from high levels of authority in political power and spiritual power down through the masses? Is there a system of evil that has existed over time, and do people pass into it through hereditary lines? That's the question we're asking. And is there an evil organization on this earth that basically functions as did the first city in the time of Cain and Abel? It's a good way to look at it. And the question I have, I know there's people out there who don't believe in the Bible, and what I'm going to do is look at evil coming from the story of Cain and Abel. And I got 
involved in this when I was talking to Tupper Sasi. I'm going to refer to his book and read from it today for Rulers of Evil. When I spoke to him on the telephone many times, and we discussed this, and he said, Greg, you got to look into the story of Cain and Abel. So I did, and I always looked at it differently. And if you go to 99 out of 100 Protestant churches, which are nothing more than Catholic churches today, they're not going to give you this story either. Because what it does is it indicts the Vatican. It indicts major governmental powers. And it shows you a pattern that's existed for thousands of years. Now, you out there who don't believe in the Bible, just indulge me for a minute and think of it this way. The people I am talking about the hierarchy of the Vatican, the hierarchy of business, many people involved in these secret societies and the governmental officials in charge at the highest levels. Many of them are Luciferians. And without getting into a huge discussion on Satanism and Luciferianism, if they believe in Lucifer, then they believe in God. So then what I'm going to tell you about this book in the Bible is coming at it from what they believe. And if they control you and you're an atheist and you don't believe in it, you ought to know what they believe. And if they believe in Lucifer, they have to believe in God. And if they subscribe to exactly what the book of Cain and Abel teaches us, then you have an idea where evil comes from, from their point of view. You may have a completely different one, but it doesn't really matter. If you're being controlled by them, don't you want to know what they're thinking? Don't you want to know where it comes from? And if we go to rulers of an evil, we find that there are many myths, even in Babylonian rulership, that talk about this. Now, we understand that the Vatican is, is a Babylonian pagan religion behind the scenes, their customs, their signs, their symbols, everything is pagan, and it's passed down to the people who bow down to them, like the presidents of the United States, like the congressmen, like our foreign diplomats, like people all over the world, Putin, even the leader in North Korea, like Castro or Vaticanites. And so we're looking at a Babylonian mystery of religion, and there was a myth that coincides with the story of Cain and Abel, which I'll start with, and then we'll get into where evil may exist and how it persists today even greater than it was under the time of Cain. Now, I'm going to read from the 24th chapter of uh, Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. He says, The myth of Marduk, this is about Babylonian rulership and all this stuff, begins with Anu, the head deity of Babylonian mythology. Looking down upon earth in dismay, the land is in chaos, overrun by floodwaters and monstrous serpents. A new senses that bringing, senses that bringing, uh, <laughs> let me see here, bringing order such chaos is a job for Marduk, the firstborn son of the moon goddess Ea. So a new summons Marduk and asks him to organize the earth. Marduk agrees to the task, but only on the condition that he be made first among the gods, and that his word shall have the force of the decree of Anu. Anu accepts Marduk's terms and vests him with the powers and the insignia of kingship, and Marduk's word was declared to have the authority of Anu. Armed with this divine power, Marduk goes to earth and separates dry land from sea. He polices the monsters, and any evildoer foolish enough to oppose him receives the wrath of God. The result of Marduk's ordination was depicted in the steel Naram Sin, now in the Louvre. In this very ancient Babylonian monument, Anu is shown imbuing Naram Sin, Enoch, to the Hebrews, with power over a mass of other things. Anu's name, seen in the tip of the steel, is the cuneiform symbol for heaven, the double cross. Correct? Marduk wears the Anu's signature like a cop with a badge. It makes him a god. In fact, the ordination of power iconography of ancient Babylonian nations was never without it. Even today, 
50 centuries after the new signature, we find it in the great flag of Britain, said to be the union of St. Andrew's Scottish Cross and the St. George English Cross. We find it prominently displayed in the decor of government buildings, especially courtrooms. It forms the the motif for much of the decorative architecture of the U.S. Supreme Court building, interior and exterior. Do you hear that? The mark of a new, the the double cross, right? It's right there for you to see. It's there on the British flag. Could it be this is the signature of evil? It forms the motif, and I mentioned, I said that. It forms the motif for much of these places that I said. Now back to Tupper Sassi. The pavement surrounding the obelisk of Caliglia, or Caligula in St. Peter's Piazza. Folks, I walked over that many, many times, hundreds of times in my stay in Rome. I wish I knew that then. The pavement surrounding the obelisk of Caligula in St. Peter's Plaza, where the multitude stand to receive papal edicts and blessings, is inlaid with a gigantic and new signature. No doubt about it, a very ancient symbol has remained consistently identified with the presence of rulership. Could it be that the symbol of so much power is based on a myth? Or is it based on the fact from which the myth sprang? Think about that question. Is it a myth, those of you who believe or disbelieve the Bible? Or is it based, in fact, from which the myth sprang? Where did it spring from? The sensitive Bible reader immediately sees in the myth of Marduk a missionary adaption of the biblical account of Cain. The two protagonists are remarkably similar. Both Cain and Marduk were firstborn sons of mothers bearing almost the same name. Marduk, son of Ea, Cain, son of Eve. Both firstborns were appointed to rule over evil albeit for different reasons, Marduk because of his heroism, Cain because of his own wickedness, so that they might more effectively among evildoers, both were given protective seals of immunity by the God of heaven. God said to Cain, now, this is in in the Bible, he's been given immunity here, therefore whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, why would, and I'm asking this question to you, all of you out there, why would God give immunity or protection to the evildoer Cain? Why? Would it be better for God to just slay evil right then and there? But he didn't. He allowed Cain to go unto into the world with his protection, albeit it wasn't complete immunity and complete protection, but it was protection nonetheless. Why would he protect him, as he said in the Bible sevenfold, from those who would want to slay Cain? Wow, that's a heavy question, isn't it? Now, According, we'll go back to Tupper Saucy's book. In Marduk's case, the evildoers were chaotic beings ruining a new earth, right? Cain's evildoers were persons who might slay him because he had become a homeless trespasser. The Bible details exactly why Cain became homeless. And do you know the story? Well, if you do or you don't, let's go over it. His farm refused to yield harvest because he had defiled the soil with the blood of his brother. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. We're not told why. You know, that's interesting in the Bible. We're really not told why he did. It may have been jealous rage, and it may not. Nothing in Scripture indicates that Cain ever hated Abel. The most we know of their relationship is that Cain talked with his brother and afterwards in a field murdered him. Now, we still to would that be let's say we had our modern sense of justice i'm I'm talking here he would be hung, tried for murder, and sent to prison for the rest of his life, no protection whatsoever, but God doesn't do that. Why is that a just God? Those are questions you can ask 
God, if you were you just when you did that, why didn't you kill Cain, I ask? He had another plan, and who am I to judge God's plan? But is it in his plan where we can understand why evil exists today even greater than it did during the time of Cain? Back to Tupper Sasi. We're not told why he killed Abel. It may have been jealous rage, he said. The most we know is that Cain talked to his brother, like he said, and killed him. Nor are we given details of the murder, except that it was bloody. He didn't, what, he hit him over the head with an axe? Did he, he didn't shoot him. There weren't guns back then, I guess. What did he do? Hit him with a rock? I guess he could make a knife. They never say. But the blood is an important clue as to motive. Back to uh, Mr. Saucy. We know that Cain was first crestfallen, then angry at God, for preferring Abel's sacrifice to his own. Abel, the shepherd, sacrificed lambs from his flock. Boy, now, to me, that's offensive. But who am I, 2,000 years or 4,000 years later, to say that? But it is. I wouldn't kill a lamb. That, to me, is harmful. I wouldn't kill an animal. I wouldn't kill any, I mean, there's Buddhists out there who won't kill a fly. And I prefer them to the, you know, guy who goes around killing every little insect he sees. I wouldn't kill an, a lamb. Abel should have been judged. And Cain, who basically gave God his crop, was frowned upon and called, you know, to task because of it. Why? God, what did you do? Why was it okay to kill a lamb when it wasn't okay just to give you his crop? I would have given you the crop. Then you would have looked at me as being less and banishing me after I take my vengeance out on my brother, which I shouldn't have, but I did because I was so angry. Who knows? It's never really told, but that doesn't seem right to me. But who am I? And what I'm telling you is God made a plan, had a plan back then. This was good. Well, it was good to kill a lamb. Why? Abel the shepherd sacrificed lambs from his flock. Not one, lambs. Cain the farmer, back to Saucy, apparently thinking sacrifice was about returning the best of his productivity to God, sacrificed the best of his harvest. God found Cain's sacrifice offensive. And Abel's pleasing. Now that to me is weird. It is. Just looking at it on its surface, why is it okay to kill animals, but yet it's not okay to give God your crop? The very food that sustains your life. To me, God had, had it all wrong, but apparently who am I? And God had a plan, so let's look at this plan. What's it all based on? Elsewhere, according to Saucy in scripture, we learn why. Good. That's what I want to learn. It involves a principle that is difficult for many of us to comprehend. Yes, including me. Very difficult concept to comprehend. The principle is this. Without shedding, okay, without shedding, without shedding, say that again, Greg, of blood, there is no remission of sin. Okay, let me see if I can grasp this. Back then, it was okay to kill a lamb, and you couldn't remiss your sin unless you killed, you know, killed something. Now, was it, I guess it was okay to kill a lesser being than a human being, a chicken, a goat, a bird, than it was to kill your fellow human being. So, there was a distinction here. The blood of a human being is no-no, but the blood of animals is okay. And that remission, you couldn't do that unless your sin, well, I'm glad it's not that way today. And why isn't it that way? Well, it's because like, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, okay? I at least know that. So, Abel pleased God because he shed blood. Now, the blood of sacrificial animals. I guess it was okay. I wouldn't want to be an animal back then. No, 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 no. The great teaching of the Bible is that death, the death sentence, mankind is inherited from the original breaking of God's law by Cain's parents. 
Thou shalt not eat of the fruit. You see, it's okay to kill lambs, but not eating fruit is pardonable only by death, by the extreme act of shedding blood fatally. Hmm. This teaching is the bedrock of the Old Testament and the whole point of the New. That's it. You see, that's what people fail to do. You've got to look deeply into these things. I, I tell you, it's a hard concept even when you look deeply into it, isn't it? But that's what God's plan was. And if we believe in God, we have to believe in his plan, whether it seems ridiculous to us. I think it's ridiculous now to protect evildoers, but he does. He has to. Why would he protect Luciferians? He does. That's a fact, if you believe in the Bible. And if you don't believe in the Bible, the evildoers out there right now, I swear to God, are Luciferians, and they believe in God. So let's look at it from their point of view. Maybe we can learn something, no matter whether you're an atheist or a Christian. This teaching is the bedrock, like I said, of the Old Testament, and the whole point of the New. The Old Testament, according to Saucy, the people of God were pardoned the sinfulness inherited from Adam by shedding the blood of animals, as Abel had dutifully done. In the New, the people of God were pardoned the same sinfulness by doing exactly as Cain has done, shedding the blood of a man. To this day, according to the scriptures, all who believe that Jesus' blood has the power to remit sins are imputed sinless by God. Imputed sinless, their sentence of external separation from God is commuted, and they are given external life in heaven. Now you see, Cain was given immunity, and he was protected, but he would never ever see God. There was a proviso there. It wasn't the same protection that was given Abraham, correct? Now scripture does not tell us, according to Saucy, that God ever explained the purpose of a blood sacrifice to Cain. Now, that to me is weird too. Can he explain it to people? I mean, if he could have said Cain before Cain goes out and kills Abel, uh, hey, look, blood sacrifice is preferred only with animals, so don't go and kill your brother. He knew what was going to happen, I guess. So why did he allow this to go on? I, you know, this is the mysteries that we deal with. And the mysteries of life continue on today because we ask the same question. Why are these people in Washington so evil? Why is the Vatican so evil? Well, we're trying to figure it out. And why does God still give them protection? And we know what he wants, the best for mankind, right? That's what God wants. Back to Saucy, it's unthinkable then that he would want Cain ignorant of the life-saving effect of blood sacrifice. He must have taught Cain as thoroughly as he taught Abel. And Cain must have listened all tentatively, for we know he was anxious to please God. Otherwise, why would he have been angry and crestfallen at learning of God's dissatisfaction with the sacrifice? But Cain was more creative, maybe, than obedient. So, the question is, do you think God actually instructed Cain and Abel, or do you think he left them out in the cold? Well, let's just say that God did instruct them, but Cain then defies God maybe, right? But Cain was more maybe creative than obedient. It's entirely consistent with his character for him to have decided, okay, if it's blood sacrifice he wants, I'll give him the sacrifice he deserves, a better sacrifice than lambs. I'll give him the blood of an innocent man. Then the question arises, does God set parameters when he was talking to Cain and Abel? Don't kill men? I don't know. According to this, maybe not. It's all really up in the air, but, you know, if we believe in Lucifer and God, we believe that he had a plan that we may not even understand, as difficult as it is, and you're seeing how difficult this is. Cain's intent was evil, according to Saucy, in that he sought to improve on what God had commanded, right? In the way Saul improved on God's commandment to annihilate the Amalekites. I've always had we're at trouble with that word. By sparing their king and certain valuable livestock, Cain knew the logic of God. He was, after all, the first human being born with the knowledge of good and evil. Yes! And we know from what happened to Jesus that God's logic calls for the sacrifice of only one 
whose perfect innocence overcame death. In his obsession to please God, wouldn't Cain have regarded spilling Abel's blood as the ultimate godliness? What I am suggesting, says Saucy, is that in Cain's mind, Abel was not so much murdered as sacrificed, nailed to a news very named, hanged upon a cross. Wouldn't this explain why Scripture shows no evidence that Cain sensed any guilt? Wouldn't it also explain the hundreds of ancient pre-Christian myths of young shepherds, such as Tammuz, Bacchus, Addis, Mithras, who were slain in cold blood by various villains, only to rise from the dead, their shed their blood, having supposed propagated original sin and resurrected them to eternal life? The myths, obviously based on fact of Abel's crucifixion, all pointed to a universally accepted event, anticipated event, foretold by the Israelite prophets. Messiah's death and resurrection, which would pardon the sins of mankind and restore eternal life. All right, we only have a minute. I'm going to pick up on this tomorrow. I'm going to mark where I left off. Organization is the key to being successful. Okay, so we're presented with this huge question. In that little intro, in this little opening, it's complicated, folks. The question always comes up, where the myths True and the Bible copied, or the, or the myths copying the Bible, in a sense. What really was true? God knew it all, right? So let's look at more and come to a reason, a conclusion, a some kind of theory that makes sense about where evil comes from in our world today and why evil has grown a hundredfold, a thousandfold, with a protection by God, not a complete protection like he gave Abraham, but a protection nonetheless. Back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. Have a good night and see you tomorrow. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.